Very good evening to all of you. I'm Ms. Amakanu Shekhar, Assistant Professor of Law and Dean at U. I deem it a great privilege to welcome you all to the valedictory ceremony of the International Conference on Law and Economics 2021, jointly organized by the Tamil Nadu National Law University and Indian Association of Law and Economics. The virtual conference has been a great opportunity for us to go beyond boundaries for the advancement of knowledge and to promote the interdisciplinary field of law and economics in India and abroad. I'd like to begin the session with a grateful note to all the persons who are the organizing members for the reasons uh, for being an, an important pillar behind the success of this event. I now request all of you to raise for the Tabal Thai Award. Thank you all of you. I request everyone to be seated. Uh, without taking much of the time, I am call upon Professor Dr. Ranita Arnagar, Professor of Economics, GNLU, for delivering the welcome address. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I request you to kindly keep your mic on. Thank you. Respected Professor Dr. Elizabeth Madam, President Indian Association of Law and Economics, and Vice Chancellor of the Tamil Nadu National Law University, the host university of the International Conference 2021. <clears throat> Respected Professor Shanta Kumar, Vice Chancellor of Gujarat National Law University, and the guest of honor for the validity of ICLE 2021. <laughs> Professor Shantakumar has always recognized and appreciated the contribution of GNLU <clears throat> in the successive seven international conferences and always supports and encourages and recognizes the contribution of GNLU in the dissemination of knowledge in the domain of law and economics. Respected Professor Hans Ben Schaffer, Professor Sir, Professor Emeritus. University of Hamburg, and the founding advisor of the Indian Association of Law and Economics in 2016. Professor Nunu Garupa, George Mason University. Um, I think it's very early there, so we'll be joining a little late. Um, and he has been a very strong presence in all the endeavors of the Indian Association of Law and Economics. Respected Dr. Thomas Felix, Assistant Professor Economics, Tamil Nadu National Law University, and a very successful convener of ICLE 2021. The organizing committee of ICLE 2021, comprising of Professor Kumaresan, Professor Azad, Professor Nidish, Professor Samandha from Tamil Nadu National Law University, and Professor Hitesh Thakkar, Advocate Sai Liganu. Mr. Sunny Bhushan, representing the Indian Association of Law and Economics, all faculty and staff members of Tamil Nadu National Law University, the brilliant paper presenters from across India and the international participants, the observers and all the student volunteers, 
it is my privilege and honor to welcome you all to the validatory of ICLE 2021. The validatory session gives occasion to briefly encapsulate the vision, the direction, and the outcome of this four-day academic exercise made possible by great hard work and contributions of many. Importantly, the International Conference on Law and Economics 2021 pretty much coincided with the celebrations of the Constitution Day in India, 26th November. It is imperative to put on record the words of the Chief Justice of India, Justice Ramanna. Justice Ramanna, at his Vigyan Bhavan speech, started his speech with we, the people of India. He said, we are a liberal constitutional democracy and our constitution is an outcome of the struggle for socio-economic emancipation. He said, the constitution is a modern, progressive and scientific document. He expressed his concern, deep concern, on India's critical position in the hunger index and the recent Niti Aayog report on poverty. He said the framers of the constitution have made accountability. I stress again, the word accountability as central to the parliament and the institutions. He also said the judiciary can only ensure ex ante adjudicated justice, whereas ex ante social economic justice can be ensured by the parliament and the government. At this point, allow me to walk us through the contours of ICLE 2021, which have echoed the spirit of the Constitution Day celebrations. Professor Bimal Patel, the chief guest of ICLE 2021, termed the law and economics movement in India as a Gyan Yagna. He highlighted the selfless essence of the role of the Indian Association of Law and Economics in creating this platform for the young researchers, enthusiasts of law and economics in India. Professor Elizabeth Madam, in her presidential address, set the purpose and the purpose of the conference. She asked academia to look at the ground reality and ask the question, who benefits from the law and policy? She stressed upon the imperative to discuss the serious issues of the marginalized in India. Professor Ritu Diman made the necessary and strong points on the manner in which broad policies and COVID response in particular have been gender blind. She advocated for all out advocacy in order to correct this age old wrong. Professor Amit Ray made the convincing argument for health as a public good during the COVID crisis as the only effective health sector response. Professor Chinmay Tumbe made the brilliant case of comparing the age of pandemics from 1817 to 1920 up to the present 2020 crisis. And his observation is that the similarities of all these pandemics are an eye-opener and the medical health infrastructure and pandemic combat capacities eternally insufficient. Professor Thomas Ullen, Swanland Chair Emeritus, University of Illinois, raised a very interesting question of the unexplainable vaccine hesitancy and the attitude of resistance to obeying the government mandate in USA by a set of people who he correlated belong to a particular ideology. Professor showed polarization and its rigidities creates mindsets that are blind and immune to what is beneficial to individuals and the country. He urged to be guided by scientific truth. Professor Stephen White, University of Hamburg raised the question of unconstitutional states of emergency which discussed the question of individual rights versus government authority and put the debate on the center stage. His work showed 
that the importance of parliamentary democracies where unlawful state of emergencies is way less than alternate forms of government. So all constitutions have a state of emergency, but he proved empirically that uh, the parliamentary democracies have lesser cases of such problems. Professor Dalvi, professor of finance, Long Island University, discussed the question of monopoly power to the extent that they, he, he showed abuse of monopoly power by the tech giants and uh, displayed the limitations of the antitrust law. Therefore, in summation, the core of the conference 2021 is about making accountable and taking responsibility in consonance with Justice Ramana's statement. The developed world be made accountable and responsible towards the lesser developed world and more so in pandemic. The government be made accountable and responsible towards an equitable policy response and create capabilities both during sorry, before, during, and in the persistent continuance of the pandemic. This becomes more relevant in the face of the new virus, the Omicron, that is of risk. The policy response be made accountable to the Constitution of India with focus on women and the vulnerable. The tech giants representing the current state of the neoliberal market be made accountable and responsible to consumer protection. The government be made accountable and responsible to product, protect civil liberties in order to build a strong citizenry, to make education accountable and responsible to democratic, secular, and scientific values as against dogmatic, bizarre, and unscientific beliefs. The important papers presented by scholars reflect the pursuit of this secular scientific knowledge coming from the two dominant disciplines of law and economics. The International Conference of Law and Economics 2021 has spoken on issues of critical importance for the people of this country. May I underline the word people of this country? I repeat, and, and this conference therefore is an entrenched testimony of academic accountability and responsibility to constitutional values. I once again welcome this esteemed gathering to the validity of the International Conference 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Professor Anita, for the warm words and insights on the conference. It is indeed a proud moment for all the members of the organizing committee to have successfully completed this four day international conference and to report on the ICLE 2021, I would like to welcome Dr. K. Thomas Felix, Assistant Professor, Economics, TNLU. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, respected Chief Guest, Professor Hans Bern Schaeffer, Professor Emeritus at the University of Hamburg, the Guest of Honor, Dr. Uh, Nuno Garupa, Professor of Law, George Mason University, and Professor Santakumar, Vice Chancellor, GNLU. The chief pattern of ICLE 2021, Professor Dr. V. S. Elizabeth, Vice Chancellor, TNLU. The Register of TNLU, Ms. Leela, Professor Manoj Dalvi, Professor Dr. Ranita Nagar, Professor Dr. Murali Prasad, Professor Krishna Devarao, Vice Chancellor, Delhi National Law University, the advisory board members, other dignitaries, faculties, and student friends. On behalf of the ICLE 2021 Organizing Committee, I would like to welcome you all to the ICLE 2021's valedictory function. You may uh, know about the story of Chinese bamboo. If you sow a Chinese bamboo seed today, it will take five years to sprout. But once it sprouted, within a month, it grows up to 90 feet. That is, it grows three feet per day. The Chinese bamboo tree will take five years to strengthen its root to achieve this higher growth rate. Similarly, it took us eight months for these four days. For the ICLE 2021, papers were invited under 12 themes, namely the theories and evidence of law and economics, law and economics of private laws, 
laws and economics of public laws, law and finance, regulation and business law, economics of legal procedure, big data, technology and artificial intelligence, gender dimensions of law and economics, the cultural dimensions of law and economics, law and economics of justice and equality, law and economics, history, institution, public policy and other substantive areas of law and economics. The organizing committee decided to invite only the full papers. We received 88 full papers, including papers received from Spain, Italy, Germany and Brazil. Out of that 88 papers, 47 papers were retained for the presentation during the conference. Totally 140 members registered for the ICLE 2021. The ICLE 2021 uploaded for 16 technical sessions, five plenary talks and a roundtable discussion besides the inaugural and validity sessions. The first day of the conference started with welcoming and opening ceremony. The chief guest, Professor Bimal N. Patel, Vice Chancellor, Rashi Raksha University, addressed the gathering by stating the importance of land economics and how land economics can improve the efficiency of the legal system. The convener of the ICLE 2021, Dr. Thomas Felix, formally welcomed the delegates. Professor Dr. Murali Prasad gave a brief introduction about the International Conference on Land Economics and the Indian Association of Land Economics. Professor Dr. V. S. Elizabeth, Chief Patron of ICLE 2021 and the Vice Chancellor TNLU gave the presidential address. She talked about the context of holding conference in the national law universities. The inaugural session ended with the vote of thanks given by Dr. Hitesh Thakar, Assistant Professor of Economics, GNLU. Apart from the inaugural session, we had three technical sessions and one plenary session in day one. In the plenary session one, Dr. C. Rangarajan, former chairman, Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister and former RBA Governor, gave a talk on evolving contours of monetary policies, which was moderated by Dr. Naresh Bhotke, Associate Professor of Economics, GP Pune. Dr. Sri Rangarajan talked about the issues in monetary policies, objectives of the monetary policies, tools through which the policy works. And he also spoke about the concerns of RBA stability, like stability on output, exchange rate, and price stability. Technical session one was chaired and co chaired by Ms. Shubangi Rai and Mr. Sunny Bosan. The theme of that session was land economics of private laws. In that session, we had a fruitful discussion on the legal prohibition, legal intricacies in the treating data as a subject of contract of bailment and how to mitigate adverse selection in life and health insurance contracts. Technical session two and three were chaired by Dr. Malabika Paul and co-chaired by Mr. Nitish. The theme of that session was theories and evidence of land economics. Four papers were presented in that session. So the main discussions are what is the effect of pandemic on MSME, patenting for startups, what is the opportunity cost of witnesses' testimonies in criminal justice system, and the issues of defensive medicine and medical malpractices in India. In day two, we had six technical sessions, a plenary talk, and a roundtable discussion. Technical session four was chaired and co-chaired by Dr. L. Bengrachalam and Ms. Shanti Samanda. The theme of that session was land economics of public laws and land economics of justice and equality. Three papers were presented in that session, so they discussed about how the artificial intelligence enhanced the efficiency of Italian judicial system, the culpable homicide is a murder or manslaughter, and the existing, what are all the problems with the geriatric mental health care system in India. Technical session five was chaired and co-chaired by Dr. K. Thomas Felix and Ms. Kuntavai Shuresh Kumar. The theme of the session was big data, technology, and artificial intelligence. Three papers were presented in that session. So they discussed about the how artificial intelligence and cyber crimes impact the Indian economy. And what are all the factors which determine the adoption of mobile government services? And how does Google help in deterring property crimes in India? Technical session six and seven were chaired and co-chaired by Dr. Isha Badwa and Dr. P. Kumarasan. The theme of the session was law and finance. There are five papers were presented in that session. So they discussed about digital economy and taxation, contemporary understanding of crypto and digital currency, 
independence of the RBI, the e-banking and forgotten role of the economic theory of taxes in litigation. Technical session eight and nine were chaired and co-chaired by Dr. Shalina Shushan Matthew and Ms. Sayali Gan. The theme of the session was economic of legal procedure. There are five papers were presented in the session. So they discussed about law and economics in the technological management of Brazilian judiciary, economic analysis of alternate dispute resolution in resolving IP disputes, possible economic and practical alternatives to incarceration for petty theft in India. In plenary session two, Professor Dr. Thomas Ullen, a research professor, University of Illinois College of Law, gave a talk on who are you to tell me what to do? Which was moderated by Professor T. S. Somsegar, Professor of Economics, NLSAU. Professor Dr. Thomas Ullen has talked about public goods, externality, social cost, and social benefits. He also stated that the social media platform can make misinformation into disinformation. In the ICLE 2021, we had a roundtable discussion on COVID pandemic Indian experience. Professor B. Santakumar, Professor of Economics, Azim Premji University, was the moderator for that session. Professor Amit Shomandre, faculty JNU Delhi, gave a talk on the pandemic, the public character of health, and revisiting the IPR debate. Professor Ritu Diwan, President, Indian Association of Women's Studies, talked about pandemic policy and patriarchy. And Professor Chinmay Itumbe, faculty IAM Ahmedabad, gave a detailed talk on the age of pandemics from 1817 to 1920 and how they shaped India and the world. In day three, we had five technical sessions and two plenary sessions. The technical session and 11 were chaired and co-chaired by Dr. Chitra Saruparya, Mr. S. Mohammad Dasa and Advocate Vivek Pandey. The theme of the session was regulation and business law. Totally five papers were presented in the session so they discussed about the competition policy in public procurement, the future of special purpose of acquisition companies in India, the Real Estate Act on consumer production, whether the shareholder activism in India is a reality or a mirage. The technical session uh, 12 and 13 were chaired by Professor Dr. Mamata Biswal and co-chaired by Dr. Hitesh Thakar. The theme of the session was regulation and business law. Totally six papers were presented in that uh, session. So they discussed about the nexus between the corporate social responsibility and the Indian agriculture. What are the implications of dominance in health sector? Also, they have discussed the gold policies in India. In technical session 14, it was chaired by Professor Dr. Murali Prasad and co-chaired by Dr. A. Maurice Port. The theme of that session was other substantive areas of law and economics. Totally three papers were presented in that session. So they discussed about uh, the legal and economic benefit of formalizing food delivery workers, the odd and even rule in Delhi, and the property rights and exploitation of environmental resources in India. In the plenary session three, Dr. Stephen Oy, Director, Institute of Law and Economics, University of Hamburg, gave a talk on unconstitutional states of emergency, which was moderated by Professor Shubashish, Dean, Indian School of Public School. Dr. Stephen talked about under what conditions government behavior under a state of emergency deviates from constitutional provisions. He states that the autocratic governments are more likely to renege against the constitution than domestic governments. So, in the, in the plenary session four, Professor Manoj Dalvi, Professor of Finance, Long Island University gave a talk on superstar, tech giant and antitrust, comparison of US, European Union and India, which was moderated by advocate Vivek Ponte, High Court of Madhya Pradesh. Professor Manoj Dalvi talked about the central antitrust issues, particularly as it relates to such large tech firms with significant market powers as Amazon, Apple, and Google. In day four, we had two technical sessions and IALE general body meeting. Technical sessions 15 
was chaired and co-chaired by Professor Ram Singh and Dr. Anjani Singh Tomer. The theme of the session was other substantive areas of law and economics. Totally four papers were presented in the session. They discussed about refugees and their impact on law and economics, compulsory licensing and COVID-19 vaccines, economic marginalization, non-coherent with equity policy. The technical session 16 was shared and co-chaired by Professor Dr. Ranta R. Nagar and Dr. Uchkar Leo. The theme of the session was gender dimension of law and economics. Totally four papers were presented in the session. They discussed about sexual harassment law, poverty and access to drinking water and socioeconomic issues and gender inequality in West Bengal, cost benefit analysis of unpaid caregiving and its impact on the job of working mothers. We are happy that all the registered paper presenters presented their papers without taking any leave. We hope the past four days have been fruitful and that you will be able to make the most from the sessions you attended. Through a wide range of plenary speeches, roundtable discussions, technical presentations and discussion, we have been presented with new views of law and economics. We hope that you shared your experience and expertise with other participants from near and far and that a cordial relationship established among us during the ICLE 2021 conference. It will further strengthen. But of course, the real measure of this conference success lies in how it will affect you. That means the participant or more precisely how it will affect the actions you will take after leaving this conference. We look forward in the next ICLE. It may be 2022. We are looking forward in the next ICLE. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Felix, for a detailed report that informs us of the huge contributions we had in the conference. Uh, I now request Professor Dr. Murali Prasad, Professor of Economics, IIT Kanpur, to give a short introduction about the chief guest of the validatory function, Professor Hans Bernd Schaffer. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I thank uh, IALE and ICLE uh, for giving me this opportunity uh, to introduce Professor Schaefer. Uh, Professor Schaefer is currently affiliated uh, Professor of Law and Economics in Vicarious Law School, Hamburg, Germany. He has published several scientific papers and books. Uh, he has visited several institutions across the world and motivated scholars to work in the field of law and economics. Professor Schaefer was fellow of the Norwegian Academy of Science, Oslo, distinguished visiting faculty at Toronto University School of Law, honorary professor, faculty of law, University D. San Martin D. Boris, honorary member of the Polish Association of Law and Economics, and scholar prize of the European Association of Law and Economics. He has served as director, Hamburg branch of the European Master Program in Law and Economics. Director, Marie Curie Fellowship Program of the German Academic Exchange Service. Director, Doctoral Program in Law and Economics at the University of Hamburg, financed by the German Science Foundation and President, European Association of Law and Economics. Uh, by saying that, I also really would like to add that Professor Schaefer, when we talk about him uh, even uh, just a few minutes back we had a gbm uh, there we have really uh, remembered his uh, valuable contribution to the formation of association indian association of law and economics so he is in instrumental uh, in uh, promotion of law and economics uh, in india and uh, he always with us uh, whenever we want his helping hand uh, to promote the interdisciplinary subject, law and economics. And uh, he, in, in one sentence, uh, it is he, love, uh, he loves India. And in my opinion, um, he is father of law and economics in India. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
And I call upon Professor Hans Bernd Schaffer, Professor Emeritus at the University of Hamburg, the chief guest of today's evening, to deliver the special address. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Is that is everything fine? And can you see my slides? Yes, so we can see your slide and we can hear also. Ah, yeah, fine. Thank you very much. Well, then, um, <clears throat> uh, dear uh, Vice Chancellor Elizabeth, if I may say so, um, uh, dear Ranita Naga, I'm glad to see you again at this occasion. Murali Prasad, my old uh, friend from Hamburg Times. And uh, I don't know whether Ram Singh is here, but he is uh, in a way um, uh, related to my talk today because we are working on a paper. We have already finished the first draft on the paper about the law and economics of big data in the internet. And that will be my, uh, my talk will be on this uh, topic. Um, let me first, uh, oh, let me, I have a technical problem. Uh, what, uh, I want to first show you how the internet platform work and uh, that we have uh, two markets here. We have a primary and a secondary markets and we have huge economic problems in both of these markets for the internet platforms. And I want to delve into these problems and then see uh, how these problems can be solved and whether they are on the way of being solved. And uh, I want to um, present uh, those uh, solutions to the problems, uh, which, um, uh, which uh, well, there are very different solutions and uh, uh, we will see uh, how much they con uh, can, can uh, contribute to uh, to solve the problems. So when I talk about uh, the internet giants, then I uh, what I mean here is basically the social media platforms like Facebook, for instance, or uh, the search machines like Google. Uh, the search machines also sell their own products sometimes, and then we have internet trade and trade platforms like Amazon. Amazon was, for instance, originally a, an internet bookshop, so to speak, but it now is a big uh, 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 trading company and it offers platforms for other, for merchants to sell their products uh, with Amazon. Um, so this, these are the, uh, the firms I'm talking about. Now, um, here, uh, this is a, uh, you know, gives you an overview about what is happening here in the, uh, in the social media um, platforms. We have, first of all, here, we, you see uh, the uh, subjects of information. These are the users, like you and me, we use uh, the internet platforms. And the users, uh, they um, get a service from the controllers of information. These are the controllers of information are those who uh, run the platforms and they control information about the subjects. The subjects are protected not by a property right, by a public, they are publicly pr 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 uh, protected, their privacy is protected, but the privacy is not an inalienable right, it can be transferred. So it is often transferred to the internet uh, platforms. The internet platforms provide a service. When you Google, then uh, what you do, you give them your search history, so they know everything which you have uh, Googled and, uh, uh, and they provide a valuable service for you. 
And this market here between the subjects of information and the controllers of information, this is called the primary market. And when we ask uh, what kind of problems we have in the primary market, then there are lots of problems. Well, first of all, um, the users, the subject of information, they are protected by privacy rules, but they don't have a, a comprehensive right uh, about their own data. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, 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 as soon as the data are um, depersonalized, hello? As soon as the data are depersonalized or anonymized, they do not belong anymore to the subjects of information. So they, uh, and uh, we have here a big problem that the subjects of information as citizens, they are very concerned about their privacy. But when they use the internet, they are carefree. They give up their privacy uh, uh, for this service very easily. Uh, this is a problem um, uh, and it has been addressed. I come to that a little later. For instance, uh, it was until recently, it was just possible in Europe, in the European Union, to uh, waive your privacy rights just by confirming that you accept the terms and conditions of the of the uh, uh, controllers of information. That is not possible anymore. You have to explicitly waive your right. You can say yes or no, and then you might use or not use the internet platform. But basically what happens here is uh, uh, the uh, subjects of information waive their privacy rights and they get a service for this. And um, this is, uh, I'll come to that a little later, by in some parts of the literature, this is regarded as exploitative. There is an almost radical discussion about this, that these subjects of information are deprived of their own data I will show you that this is somewhat flawed. The argument is somewhat flawed, but that is a, plays a big role. Now the controllers of information, what they do, first they harvest big data, you know, billions and billions of data. They store these data. And uh, as far as the subjects of information have waived their privacy rights, they, um, uh, they uh, can, um, uh, they can um, um, uh, create new data sets, new big data sets, uh, which have economies of scope, which are very valuable on the market for, for many purposes, for advertising, for political parties, uh, for uh, research, for the situation of, uh, the, for the healthcare and so on. So they produce and use and sell derived data sets. Uh, they uh, sell these derived data sets, for instance, to end users. That might be companies who uh, want uh, information about customers and so on. And uh, these data sets which they sell, uh, they are, um, this is the so-called secondary markets if they sell these data sets. And these data sets can be personalized data or they can be depersonalized data, but both personalized data sets and depersonalized data sets might be very valuable on the market because if that they are valuable if they are personalized, it's quite easy to understand, but they can also be very valuable if they are depersonalized because they say something about people with the same sex or people with the same age or people who live in a, the same neighborhoods and so on. These are, can be very valuable uh, data for many purposes. And uh, also these controllers sell, and this is now a very big problem, they sell the raw data uh, to, not the derived, but the raw data to other companies to other internet companies 
who have their own ideas how to create derived data sets. So, the, you, you, you know, you have a market of internet firms and these internet firms consist of the giants, but also of startup companies, other companies, and they want to have access to these data here. Now, if you look at the legal um, protection of these controllers of information, then uh, one can say that uh, for on the raw data, the legal protection is legally, the legal protection is very weak. The controllers of information, that is those companies like uh, Google, for instance, which uh, which uh, which harvest the data, the raw data, and store them, they have almost no property rights on the uh, on the raw data, except um, um, uh, uh, except um, trade secret protection. The uh, trade secret, but trade secret is a right is a contractual right. It is not a property right. It is not a right which the owner of this right can use against everybody in the rest of the world, so-called erga omnes rights, as we call them, uh, a right which, uh, which, which uh, we can use against everybody. But these are uh, these, um, uh, these um, trade secrets, right, are contractual rights with uh, employees, for instance. So, if Google has employees uh, and these employees use these data, they cannot, uh, if they lose, if they uh, uh, if they um, start their own business or if they uh, go to another company, they cannot take these data with them. That is trade secret. But this is only a right against employees and against other companies who work, uh, which work for the controllers of information on a contractual basis. So if everybody else, if a third person gets hold of these data, these raw data, or has access to, it, to them, uh, then he, um, the uh, controllers of information have no legal rights. So, for instance, uh, if uh, in India, for instance, uh, many things which are patented in other countries are not patented in, in India, but they are still, uh, for instance, medicine, uh, but still uh, um, uh, trade secrets are, uh, trade secrets are still protected. But if you buy, if a company buys a pill and then by reverse engineering knows how the pill is produced, it can produce it. And so is the situation here uh, with the controllers. So there is a very weak protection of property, but in fact, what we observe uh, in the real world is that uh, these controllers have a de facto property right, a de facto right, which is a very strong right uh, uh, not a de jure right, a de facto right, because they use very uh, good uh, de, um, encryption uh, software, and they can uh, they can uh, uh, protect uh, these data. And this causes now a big problem on this market here, on the secondary market. You know, we have here companies, startup companies, smaller companies who all want to have access to these data, which are harvested from the subject of information, which you who use the internet platform. But this market here, uh, uh, the controllers of information, that is the Google, Facebook, and so on, they can control this market. There is no, you know, they, uh, there is no access and by controlling this market, they can block the downstream uh, secondary market and keep uh, from developing a, uh, you know, a flourishing uh, secondary market uh, on these derived data. So this is the uh, situation for the um, for the uh, uh, for the uh, 
personalized but also depersonalized data. They are factually actually controlled. And it is the question how uh, and whether and how these firms here, um, the competitive firms, can have access to these wealth of data here. So these are the raw data. Now uh, I come to the um, processed data or the what we call the derived data sets. That these are the derived data sets which are sold to end users and they are very valuable. These data sets, the, de the derived data sets, they are um, IT protect, uh, IP protected. Usually in most countries in the EU, also in the United States, these derived data sets, the big data sets, uh, they are creations of, uh, of intelligent people who, uh, uh, who mix these data with other data, personal data with data about things and so on. They become very valuable and they are protected by um, copyright usually, which is a very strong legal protection. And uh, this is also a little debated that the derived data sets should be IP protected uh, uh, and then uh, uh, and that enables uh, a, a, um, a market here on, on this a secondary market. Uh, now, um, let me um, so, as I uh, said already, the subject of information, they have privacy rights and they have uh, um, um, no rights uh, if the information is depersonalized. Data controllers, copy uh, the derived data sets are copyright burning. Now, let me come to some uh, un uh, problems. The data which uh, the internet companies uh, provide uh, can be used to improve the allocation of resources in an economy. Uh, so, uh, for instance, we have get totally new products and services, Uber, cap hailing platforms, home owners provide part of their time for rental services and so on. We have uh, also, these data can be used to improve the contracts. Uh, many, um, many, uh, con uh, many contingency of contracts cannot, can dif is difficult to observe. We have asymmetric information and so on. And we can uh, make concept uh, contracts better verifiable, for instance, insurance contracts. Uh, so that is also an, uh, a valuable um, uh, productive use. Uh, but uh, the data, these data cannot only be used for, let's say, better um, advertisement, uh, uh, better marketing strategies and so on, and uh, increase the uh, productivity of resources, but they can also be misused or be used for uh, income redistribution. So for instance, if you have a um, derived data set, which is however still individualized because people have given up their privacy, then uh, this allows, um, um, companies who sell, which sell products on the market to individualize prices. So in, uh, in theory, it would be possible to think about a company which sells uh, a particular good to any individual to, at a different price and thus skimming the consumer surplus. Now skimming the consumer surplus is not by itself inefficient, but uh, if you compare a um, competitive market with a market with such a monopoly market in which all the consumer surplus is uh, skimmed, 
then uh, of course uh, it uh, reduces the consumer it reduces consumer welfare to almost nothing and uh, if that is costly to achieve then we have a you know we have just an income a wealth transfer uh, and we have from the consumer to the producer and uh, this wealth transfer is not only a wealth transfer, but it is a costly wealth transfer because you have to produce a very, uh, in a costly way, uh, data which makes these, or data sets, derived data sets which makes this possible. Uh, another thing is, for instance, if, an, if the employer knows many things about his employee, he can st act strategically or they strategically respond is possible, which is again inefficient. Um, so, for instance, um, uh, one example which one finds in the literature is that if the employer knows uh, or can know about medical psychic treatment, then the that might have reactions on the side of the person who is uh, psychically ill. He will not go to the doctor, and therefore. Uh, you know, this uh, this reaction is, of course, something which we do not want to have. Uh, also, what is a big problem, especially with platforms like Google, uh, like uh, Amazon, Amazon uh, sells its own product on this platform, all kinds of products, and Amazon allows other companies to use uh, their platform also to sell their products. But these uh, firms which sell their products via Amazon, uh, they disclose to Amazon uh, what their business idea is. And Amazon knows the whole clicking history of all customers and understands the business better than the, than the startups them, themselves. And then when the startups are very successful, Amazon buys them, or if it doesn't, if they do not want to sell, it, um, you know, it, it imitates, it can easily imitate uh, their business model because they understand the business model uh, better than uh, the startup companies themselves. That is also a very problematic uh, aspect of the uh, internet. Um, well, uh, then we have, uh, there is one economic element here. We have um, huge economics to scale here in this sector. Uh, we have um, uh, basically these companies have very high fixed cost and almost no variable costs. Uh, so they are in a way, natural monopolists. Uh, and, uh, and we have network effects. Network effects, it is obviously that in companies like Facebook, we have net, well, network effects because the more Facebook users exist, the, the better it is for any user. But these network effects also accrue to search machines, for instance, because the search machines, they function by uh, intelligent and by artificial intelligence, which means that the algorithms with, uh, which the search machines use learn by doing. And the more users a, net, a machine, a network, uh, 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 a search machine has, the more learns the algorithm and the better becomes the machine. So also here, we have um, uh, we have uh, uh, a network effects, and these two things together, economies to scale and network effects, drive all these internet giants, or they started very small but became giants because there is an, a, a tendency uh, for. Uh, to run into to a monopoly or at least a market dominating position. Um, then also what is a big concern here is the internet platform neutrality. So for instance, um, uh, assume you 
uh, you look for a particular uh, good in the internet, in Google, then uh, Google might uh, use um, algorithms for ranking algorithms which prefer the products of Google or their, 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 uh, their daughters, their uh, you know, subsidiaries, uh, which you find uh, on a privileged place, and not because they are the best product or the most, uh, 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 the product which are best for your taste and so on, but because they are from, uh, because Google provides them. And this also, of course, is, reduces the competition and the efficiency of resource uh, allocation. Now, um, um, now let me come to the, this argument that some scholars uh, argue that the subjects of information are deprived by their own data. And this allows the huge, you know, fairy tale profits of companies like Fa Facebook, for instance. Facebook uh, makes huge profits. So in, in the year 2020, they had sales of $109 billion and earnings of 47 billion dollars and this uh, you must uh, i don't know whether you are familiar you know where if you uh, multiply uh, or if you divide the uh, the earnings uh, the revenues uh, by the earnings uh, then you get a um, uh, a ratio of for facebook of more than 40 percent profits over uh, sales is the ratio and that is very very high of course we do not uh, know exactly what is this a pioneer profit or is this um, a monopoly profit uh, because facebook is of course still a pioneer firm but it is uh, uh, this is difficult to sort out for even for trained economists very difficult to uh, to find this out but i give you Two figures only, you know, they make a profit over sales uh, ratio of more than 40%. Volkswagen company, for instance, has a equivalent uh, ratio of 4%. That is one tenth of this. And uh, I came across one uh, study which tried to calculate uh, this ratio for the um, for service firms in Europe, in the European uh, Union, which came uh, to a ratio between six and 7%. So if you compare 4% and six to 7% with 42%, uh, you see there is a huge uh, difference between them. And uh, some say that, you know, that this profit uh, should go to the owners of the data, that is to the subjects of information that is especially Pistor, but also others. Now I want to deal with this here. So this is a radical critique uh, of insufficient protections of the subjects of information. And uh, that has been promoted by Pistor from Columbia University, Boyle from Rutgers University. That is the uh, exploitation theory which is also called, uh, uh, which is also called the so-called second enclosure narrative. What is that? What does that mean? Second enclosure. Now, those of you who might be um, familiar with English history know that in the late Middle Ages, the um, um, the common land, uh, the land in England was mainly free land or common land. And then the English nobility started to fence the land in and deprive the uh, farmers, the English farmers of their land, uh, which was, uh, you know, they lost their livelihood, many lost their lives. It uh, 
led to strife. It lasted for many uh, decades or many even hundreds of years until the land was finally um, uh, transferred. The title of the land was transferred to the nobility. This is the first enclosure. Uh, and uh, these authors argue that in the internet, we have today a second enclosure that is we, the people, the users of the internet, we are deprived of our data and uh, the huge profits are made by the internet giants and they steal these profits from us. We should get these profits. Now, uh, I, I want to tell you why I am not in favor of this theory. Uh, usually, um, the when we from an, when we ask from an economic point of view, why do we have private property? Then uh, the answer to this is we have private property because this is a legal institution which guarantees that a resource, a thing flows always to the highest valued user. So if somebody has an unrestricted uh, domain, an unrestricted uh, dominion over a thing, then um, uh, he has an interest to sell it off, which he, which he can transfer, to sell it off to somebody at a, at a price which is higher than his own valuation. And so there is a tendency that this resource flows to the person or to the firm or to the person uh, who values it most. But this is a rationale which applies for things, for physical things, but not for information. Information uh, for information is information is a public good. Information you can if you use the information I can also use it. Everybody uh, can use a valuable information. So therefore, the economic theory says that information should be free. Everybody should have the information for free with only one exception, namely if we want or if we have to provide incentives to produce new and valuable information. Then we have a trade-off between these two rationales uh, for information. Uh, for uh, if information, uh, if the stock of information would be the same all the time, then the only legal and economic problem would be how can we uh, disseminate this information and let all people in the world share the information. And the IP, the rationale for IP and especially for the protection of information is not the same as the rationale for the protection of private property of things. But it is only the rationale that we uh, uh, have to, um, that sometimes we have to make, give incentives to produce new information and then we get a trade-off between rapid dissemination of information and production of new information and that leads to intellectual property rights. But that is a totally different uh, rationale than a property of things. Uh, well, sometimes, you know, in this discussion, we have also the um, idea that these are our own data. They belong to us irrespective of any economic, uh, you know, efficiency criteria, that they are our own data, we have produced them. You know, that goes back to Locke, this Lockean labor theory of property, that if you produce something with your own labor, you become the owner of these things, regardless of whether this is efficient or not. And I think that the uh, labor theory is cannot be applied here. For one thing, uh, these information, you know, the clicking history or your clicking history or your um, Facebook and, and what you do on Facebook and so on, that is not 
um, that is a byproduct of what you are doing anyway. You buy something and then you search and so on. So it is a byproduct. It is not labor in the usual sense. And there is therefore no, um, uh, there is no uh, rationale, no economic rationality in incentivizing people to click even more. You know, that is, uh, that, uh, the, therefore it cannot be legitimized with the labor theory. Now, uh, another and of course very important rationale of uh, data protection is privacy protection. But privacy protection is not the, 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 the rationale of private uh, protection is not an economic rationale. Privacy protection is, um, uh, is de uh, derivated from our fundamental human rights, such as our dignity, our privacy, our, the intimacy that must be protected irrespective of economic, uh, of economic uh, consideration. Uh, 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 but this privacy protection is a non-economic rationale and it is privacy protection and property protection are two different things. Now we, I'm from, as you know, I'm uh, from Germany. In Germany, we have a constitutional court and we had a landmark decision of the constitutional court in which the constitutional court had exactly to deal with this problem because there was the, you know, the uh, plaintiffs, they wanted a judgment that they own their data. And the, uh, here is a citation from the, this landmark decision of 1983. The individual does not have a right in the sense of an abs absolute unrestricted dominion over her data. That is the, uh, and therefore the, uh, the constitutional court made um, uh, the uh, data property uh, made a difference between privacy protection and data protection. Privacy protection is mandated by our constitutional values, by the constitutional rights which we enjoy, by our dignity, uh, but not more. And it, can, it cannot be extended to a comprehensive right on data. That is, if my data are anonymized, then they are not my data anymore. And I think there is a, a good economic uh, reason for this. Um, and therefore my view here, that's not my view alone, but it's uh, part of the literature. Uh, it, it, there is a, a, a comprehensive property of one's own data beyond privacy protection lacks legitimacy. That does not exclude, of course, that uh, these personal data as long as uh, they are protected by privacy protection, that they can also be sold or be bartered against a service or even against money, but it should not go beyond uh, what is necessary for, private protect, uh, for privacy protection. Now, uh, I told you that some of the biggest problems here uh, are in the so-called secondary market. Now we have the big internet giants and they are, um, you know, they are gatekeepers, they are uh, monopolists, or they are at least very powerful um, uh, companies. And they, um, they uh, block the downstream markets. And the question is now, how can we, guarantee that downstream markets uh, evolve and are competitive and reduce the monopoly profits. That is one of the big questions uh, which we have to deal with. And um, uh, to answer this question, um, we have basically two legal forms with which we can try to solve this problem. One legal form is um, property. That is, we could say 
these controllers, these big internet firms, they must share their raw data, at least if they are anonymized, with everybody who runs a business, who wants access to this data. And this can be governments, this can be, um, this can be uh, research institutions, for instance, on data on health data, if they are depersonalized, that can be um, other firms, uh, but especially this uh, should be uh, other internet firms who specialize in producing and creating new and valuable derived data sets. So that is one possibility uh, to organize the harvested data as a global commons. So that is one possibility. The other possibility is to uh, um, uh, use a competition law that is antitrust law and say that if, they, uh, if the companies do not share these data, if they misuse their rights, then, they, uh, then a, a court can decide that they must share it to, with others. So, and I just want to, con uh, to concentrate on these uh, two possibilities. Um, uh, you know, uh, as I told you before, these huge profits are at least partly, not only pioneer profits, but also monopoly profits uh, resulting from control of downstream markets. And, um, uh, I told you that these raw data have a very weak legal protection. But the weak legal, pro legal protection, it is not an aga omnes rights which they have, but only they, but they are sitting on these data and uh, together with encryption uh, um, uh, technologies which are very uh, if, uh, effective, uh, these legal, legally weak rights become factually very strong rights, like like property for data almost. Uh, so, in some strands of the literature, um, the um, uh, we have the view that this can be solved with uh, competition rights. Now, if we can. Um, a competition, uh, if we have competition uh, law, then, you know, you have competition law in India and the competition authority in India since a couple of uh, years. Also in the, uh, in the EU, we have this. And uh, so we could, one could think of opening the downstream markets by competition law. And the legal instrument here is the abuse of dominant market position. That is in the EU uh, Article 102 of the Treaty for the Functioning of the European uh, Union, abuse of dominant market position. So if the plaintiff, that is, let's say, a startup company uh, which wants to make its own derived data sets uh, from the raw data of Facebook, uh, they say, they go to court and say they do not want to give us their data. Uh, this is a misuse of a dominant abu uh, abuse of the dominant market position. And here we use in uh, Europe, but this is a, a, a doctrine which is worldwide now a very popular doctrine. That is the so-called essential facility doctrine, which was developed originally in the United States for giving access to companies to networks, for instance, railway networks. So there's a, a company which has, uh, which has um, trains, but no network. And then there's another company which has trains and network, and they do not want to, sh to share their network with, uh, with the trains from another company. And for that, the essential facility, facility doctrine was uh, was uh, established, which is now used in Europe. And I don't know exactly, but I think uh, India might also use this essential facility uh, doctrine. So then uh, you can say as a plaintiff, you say, this is a misuse of dominant market position that Google is not sharing the raw data with me. 
And I and this is an ascent, these raw data are an essential facility, and I want to have access to these data. Now, the problem with this is um, the following. Uh, first of all, competition policy or competition uh, law presupposes that in principle, the controller of data has a property, can do what the data with what he wants. He can use these data in principle as he wants to use them and uh, for his commercial interest and only if he has a dominant position and misuses the dominant position, then he must share his facilities with others. So we have, as a general rule, we have a property right, and then there are some exceptions. Uh, and um, uh, that is, uh, and then you get exceptions, and these exceptions are only case by case law. And uh, they and for the um, for the um, for the plaintiff uh, that is the internet company which wants to use these rate, uh, these data from Google, for instance, it is an uphill fight because the plaintiff in such a uh, in such a proceeding the plaintiff must not only prove market power that is not enough under this uh, it must prove a dominant position. And this is very information intensive and it leads to very long lasting uh, uh, procedures. You know, uh, the, in the uh, Megill case, 10 years and uh, in the Microsoft case, 14 years procedure. You know, I, I know the uh, Google, Google once invited me to Brussels to meet some of their, um, you know, employees. And they lodged me in a hotel in Brussels, a very nice, very luxurious hotel, but it was a boutique hotel, a small hotel with perhaps 50, 60 um, rooms, hotel rooms. And, uh, you know, somebody told me that they, that Google has um, rented the whole hotel for the whole year, for many years, uh, for their lawyers. So they had 50, 60 lawyers uh, in these uh, cases, in these uh, cases with the European Court of Justice, uh, and they paid fifty lawyers, and you can see, you know, how a problem, how difficult it is to win a case against uh, such a powerful, uh, uh, such a powerful and and, and rich uh, company, uh, which does everything to prevent it. So, bottom line is here that. Competition law uh, is a case by case exceptional uh, or opens the um, the secondary markets on a case by case secondary basis, and this uh, I think this is a dominant a dominant uh, view among economists. This alone cannot um, uh, open up the downstream markets. Now, the other, on the other hand, we have uh, the complete um, uh, opposite. So we have um, misuse of or abuse of dominant position, <coughs> which requires that the normal case is a property right to the data. Normally, you can do with your data with what we want. You can maximize your profits and sell them if you like, if you don't sell them, if you don't like, but uh, the, um, uh, there are some exceptions from this. Now, the other extreme would be free access. That is everybody who wants the raw data or the um, anonymized raw data can have access to it. Um, this would be in line with the theory of uh, information, because as I told you before, these raw data, there is no uh, uh, problem of incentivizing anyone to uh, produce these raw data. There is not uh, the, you, you don't, we don't have here uh, the trade-off between spreading information 
uh, around the whole world, valuable information, and producing new information, which leads to IP protection. So the economic rationale for IP protection does not exist here, and therefore you can argue that should be free access. But there are also with free access, there are some problems uh, which I want um, um, uh, I want to share with you. Namely, um, first of all, the it is right that here the problem of generating new information does not exist. Still, harvesting and storing the and depersonalizing data leads to some uh, costs. And therefore, um, if one has a free access, free access means you can use that without paying anything. Uh, here, um, well, uh, there is a the problem with that is that they have some costs and they should pay an administrative uh, administrative price, not a monopoly price, uh, which uh, which they, which you know a reasonable price by which the those who get these data who get access to these data, uh, pay them for storing and harvesting the data. This is one problem. Uh, the other problem is that. <coughs> Um, if everybody has access to these data, let's say to the data of Google and uh, Amazon and so on, then there is a problem that these companies must disclose things about their company and about their business idea and about their trade secrets and so on, which um, they do not reveal to anybody, which neither capital market law nor company law uh, you know, which regulates the reporting, uh, reporting to the public uh, requires from them. So they have to disclose their um, business idea. And that, that is a real problem. Uh, and that has, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, that has um, um, been the reason why in the present, you know, we have a, a data protection, uh, a, um, a data, a big data uh, regulation law is in the making. And this law is, um, uh, is still discussed. It is uh, at the European level. Uh, it is now in the European Parliament. And we had hoped that this law would include a kind of not open access, but a kind of uh, we um, um, of open data so that at least competitors would have access to these data. But this is not the case. And the reason why the European Union has not included this is exactly that they say, well, we do not want to force these businesses like Google and so on uh, to uh, reveal all their trade secrets. Uh, but uh, that has been heavily criticized by many in the European Union, here, Hauka, Parker, Populous. So the uh, European Commission has uh, asked uh, for comments and they said that we need much more. We need a kind of open, not open access, but a kind of open data that is in principle you have access to these data from Google. But, you know, the, when they present convincing reasons, they can protect their data. So that is the exactly the the, the reverse of uh, the uh, of um, of uh, competition law. In competition law, you have in principle a property right, but in there are some case by case exception to this property right and you must share your data with others. And here, what these people, Haukap, uh, who is a very well-known uh, competition um, economist in Germany, um, what they argue is we should have free access, not free access, but free data. That is a new word. So in the middle somewhere, it is not free access. It's uh, somewhere less than free access, free data, in principle, free data. and. 
<laughs> but then the internet companies, the internet giants, they must give reasons why they do not want to share. And then uh, that can also be, the problem can also be solved to some extent by masking and aggregation of the data. So the, if the internet firms can give good reasons that why they do not want to share these data because it reveals their business model, then they can, uh, they must still share them, but on a higher level of aggregation. Then they become less valuable for the uh, for the other internet firms, the downstream firms, but they are still valuable. And then also uh, uh, <clears throat> the so-called in situ rights. That would be this. The internet companies must not share their data, but they, what they can do is they must open their platforms for the algorithms of their downstream firms. So the downstream firms cannot access the data as such, but they can run their algorithm and they can um, produce their uh, derived data sets on using the data without knowing them. That is also a, a technical pro uh, possibility uh, which could solve this problem. Um, now this, uh, you know, this law that, that is the EU draft bill, the, di uh, the, uh, the, the digital market bill, it, it provides better portability, but it does not provide better data sharing. So if you have, for instance, if your own business, all the data about your own business, and you want to go from one platform to the other platform, then you can take your data with you, according to this law, the Digital Market Act of the EU. But it is not the downstream firms have no access and that is to be criticized so and you know the uh, a panel of experts have criticized this with the following words so i cite this the gatekeepers that is the big internet firms are still the unique beneficiary of the social value of the insights generated through economics of scale and of scope in data aggregation across business and end users. So they are very critical and I share this critique. Uh, let me conclude with some remarks on the secondary data for derived data sets. So it is um, a general agreement among all lawyers and all economists who have dealt with this that the derived data sets should be IP protected, that is by a copyright. Of course, um, we know that copy, copyright as such is under critique, that it is too, um, you know, it is that the copyright law is overblown, it is too strong, uh, it should be less that should be less protection the reason is this uh, uh, tragedy of the anti-commons uh, the, uh, the innovation in this field are innovation by many people by hundreds of people and then each of them has a blocking right has a veto position and then um, ip right uh, might uh, might prevent new in, in uh, information the search for new information rather than promote it but this is a different story. This is a general insight, you know, from law and economics of IP. It is not only related to uh, this. So it is, um, um, if we disregard this problem, which is a big problem, however, uh, but it's a more general uh, problem of IP protection. Now, um, the there is, however, one specific problem that is the protection of algorithms. Now, if the big internet companies have to share their data with other firms, then uh, these are not only the data, but also the computer programs. And the computer programs, that is also generally accepted that computer programs should be um, IP protected by a cop copyright. But they also include the algorithms, that is the, these mathematical step-by-step -step procedures 
which rank the data and uh, exclude data and so on. And they learn they are in, uh, artificial intelligence. They learn by doing, they get better uh, out, output um, by, by, by learning and so on. So the, uh, and um, this is also part of the package. Uh, and the uh, internet firms, they want that these algorithms should also be IP protected. And for that, there is, that is problematic. And uh, those who have dealt with this have all rejected this, that the algorithms should not be protected because uh, if the algorithm is protected, then you get the following situation. The algorithm uh, uh, contains knowledge, for instance, mathematical theorems uh, and other algorithms which are in the public domain. So which have been developed by mathematicians and so on. And, uh, and uh, this is basic research, which was always funded with tax money and is therefore in the public domain. Now assume you have an algorithm as an internet firm like Google, for instance, and they improve the algorithm a little bit and then they get a patent, not a patent, a copyright for the whole algorithm then they would get, they could appropriate what is in the public domain and make it profitable, make it privately profitable. And that reminds me of one uh, critique of uh, intellectual property um, of patent law in the Ukraine. You know, so Ukraine is the country for sunflowers because uh, the Ukrainian uh, peasants have raised sunflowers for hundreds of years, for three, four hundred years, and have gradually improved them. And now comes a modern firm, which improves the sunflower seed a little bit, you know, a tiny little bit um, with, uh, with, um, uh, with biological engineering. Uh, so it is better protected, let's say, against a particular beetle or against the weather. So, and then can appropriate this value of the sunflower seeds, uh, which existed for hundreds of years, just by improving it a little bit. And this should not happen. So, I'm coming to the end. We have basically uh, two big problems. One problem is how far should the data of the um, subjects of the information be protected. And here, my I'm not fully in line with the rest of the literature, but uh, my view and also Ram Singh's view, we discussed this. <clears throat> we think that this should not go beyond the protection of privacy. And protection of privacy is not the same thing as protection of property. There exists no um, good rationale to protect these data beyond the protection of privacy because no economic reasons exist to protect them better. Also, <coughs> the second big problem is how to open the downstream market um, and have a, you know, a competitive mark, downstream market for firms which produce uh, derived data sets. Um, how can an access of these firms to the raw data be organized? And here we, uh, our view is that competition law is important here, of course, but it cannot solve the problem. It is too, uh, it leads to lengthy procedures, 10 years and so on. <clears throat> It is a case by case, uh, a case by case uh, decision. Uh, it is important, uh, but cannot solve the problem. What we need here is not open access, but a reversal of the structure. Competition law, the structure is you have a private property of these data, but only if you are a market leader or a, have a dominant market position and misuse it, and that has to be shown by the plaintiff, then you get access to the data. So we, our, we are in favor of reversing this 
setting, uh, making it the other way around. That is, the um, default rule should be uh, open access or open data against a price, against an administrated price, and then some exceptions if the internet firms can show that this uh, would, uh, the, you know, that the sharing the raw data would force them uh, to uh, share classified information with the rest of the world. But this would be, you know, the, uh, the, the relation between the general rule and the exception would be reversed in comparison uh, to um, competition law. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Shafu, for your valuable thoughts on economics on internet and competition in it. It is highly relevant and required in these times of technology. Thank you once again. Thank you. Welcome, sir. I now request uh, Professor Manoj Talvi, Professor of Finance, Long Island University, to give a short introduction about Dr. Nuno Gaurapa, who would be delivering the validity address today. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I would just like to introduce, uh, can I request uh, Professor Schaefer to stop the screen share? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, right. Just a moment. So, is this okay now? Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Garupa or Dr. Garupa, uh, who is the Professor of Law, Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Development and uh, Faculty Director of Graduate Studies at the uh, Antonin Scalia's School of Law, which is, I think, uh, part of uh, George Mason University. Um, I was just going through his bio, uh, and uh, he's published in the Journal of Law and Economics, uh, the Journal of Legal Studies. Uh, but what is fascinating to me is uh, he has started moving his research into uh, empirical law and economics. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying this is that there's so much data available uh, in the area of in, in the area of law, which has not been studied at all. And uh, his article uh, in, I think, the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies on estimating judicial uh, ideal, uh, ideal points in bidimensional courts, uh, evidence from the Catalonia judicial outcomes. Uh, was really fascinating where he found that judicial preferences on the Spanish uh, Catalan dimension uh, does affect uh, judicial outcomes. Uh, today, he's going to talk about why judges do not like empirical studies about judges. Uh, so without further ado, uh, uh, you can take the floor, Ms. Uh, Dr. Garupa. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good morning. I hope you can hear me well. It is a uh, good morning for me. I know it's uh, late afternoon uh, in India, and and I know Bern Schaefer, who I can see here. Good morning, Bern. Good afternoon. I think it's sort of after lunch in Germany. So, <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. Before so for me. We, before lunch. <laughs> yes. So we have sort of different times here uh, in the in the in the meeting. Um, which, which, which shows uh, that, um, you know, there are advantages and advantages to everything, which is sort of an economic way of looking at things. Of course, uh, the pandemic is a big disadvantage in many regards, including the fact that uh, we cannot be with you in India uh, uh, physically at this point. But we have had the development of all this new technology um, that allows us to participate um, in all sorts of, of conferences online, which, which in itself, uh, has helped a lot of research and interactions that other, otherwise um, 
would not be possible. Uh, and, and, and as usual, there are winners and losers, as in any, any economic um, uh, analysis. I, I, I'm sure the airlines are losers, and, 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 and to some extent, a lot of academics, we will miss uh, live conferences and traveling and, do, and doing our academic tourism and sightseeing as we did in the past. But universities are very grateful that we are saving money in traveling, and we are rather using this sort of technology and of course, depending on the different constituencies, uh, we may we may have different policies going into the future. Uh, I, I can tell you that George Mason, there's already a fight uh, between faculty who wants to go back to things the way they were uh, before COVID, and of course, the administrators and the people who control the budget want to keep things in the new sort of uh, you know Zoom, um, WebEx, Skype sort of meetings because they save a lot of resources to, um, to uh, the university. So that's sort of everything as a cost benefit analysis. And what I want to talk today a little bit is about uh, the problems that um, studying the judiciary from an empirical study uh, point of view is starting to create. Um, we are seeing a movement of, um, I wouldn't call it opposition, but let's say reluctance by the judiciary to uh, disclose data and be studied the way that uh, people in law and economics and political science in sociology are, are trying to study them. And in some countries, um, some of this, this data uh, was, was never really available. So nothing really has changed because most of um, the courts were not disclosing this data anyway. But even in countries like the United States or Canada, where a lot of this data was publicly available, freely available, uh, they're starting to take um, measures to sort of change from open space to wanting to know who wants this data, why do you want this data, and have some sort of condition access to this data. And I think that reflects um, some concerns that I'm going to try to motivate. Now, let's see if I can share uh, my slides here. Um, I, I'm assuming everyone can see my slides at this point. Um, if that's not correct, please let me know. Um, and what, what I want to start is to motivate where the problem comes from and how do I see things going? So, a lot of the study of the judiciary in the past, of course, because the judiciary uh, probably mean probably more in common law jurisdictions than in civil law jurisdictions, but it doesn't really matter. The judiciary always been studied by law professors and law students and law researchers, uh, largely by looking at what they wrote, the opinions, uh, their views on case law. Occasionally, in the case of the United States, uh, by writing biographies of the most important judges. And to a large extent, what we are trying to do is explain the law by explaining uh, the judges. That has changed in the you know, late 20th century when we move the discussion to a large extent from a doctrinal perspective on what the law is about, and in that respect, what judges are doing in the courts, to what the law should be about, right? When we introduce a normative dimension, because once you, once you, 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 you introduce a normative dimension, of course, we're going to be judgmental about the courts. Because even in economics, where we try to be as neutral as possible in our judgments, uh, as soon as, as we start starting saying things like, this law is efficient, that law is not efficient, uh, the, the decision in this case follows the principles of law and economics. The decision in that case violates the principles of law and economics, we are passing judgment on decisions, on judges, by telling people that these judges follow the principles of efficiency, those judges do not follow those principles. And of course, arguably, you could say the same about applying any other standard like uh, you know, social justice, equity, fairness, or any other non-economic judgment as you may want it since People in this room, of course, tend to believe that efficiency in law and economics are do matter. But in other crowds, people have different views. 
that does not change the fact that whatever the views we have about efficiency or social justice or any other criteria, we are in fact passing judgment on how the courts operate. Now, as you know, and as was mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, uh, once you enter the 21st century, one of the concerns we had was uh, if we're going to make judgments based on consequentialist views, which was not the case of, say, um, you know, traditional philosophy of law. And in that respect, if you are going to be completely non consequentialist, uh, you don't need really to know the facts because you just need to know that judges wrote this opinion or courts made that decision in order to decide according to your moral uh, deontological theory uh, if that's right or wrong. But once you are picking the economic point of view, or largely saying the social science point of view, you need to know the consequences because our judgments are largely consequentialist. And as you all are familiar, when we got to this discussion in the 80s, Dworkin, Posner, Calabresi, Coase, all these people were largely conceptual. But as we move on in discussion, if we are going to be consequentialist, we need to know the facts. What are the consequences? Because we, keep, we can't keep you know, talking about efficiency in torts or in contracts or in competition law without actually knowing how things look like. And so we move from perceptions of consequences to how do we measure consequences? And that's when we basically introduce empirical studies, right? And the rise of empirical studies, of course, there is always the fate of being fashionable, of looking scientific, and suddenly a lot of law professors love to do regressions. Many times they don't know what they're doing with these regressions. Uh, but they think the regressions look great. We all know that's true. I'm not going to do that critique. It's been done by many people. A lot of these empirical studies in the beginning had very significant problems and attracted a lot of media attention for the wrong reasons because they were misunderstanding correlation and causation. All of those caveats we already know. But essentially, we have had 20 years now of rise of this idea that you can't just do perceptions, you have to do and measure things. As we measure things, of course, we face a lot of problems. And part of the problems is the methods become more and more complex. I mean, 20 years ago, uh, we were basically doing counting descriptive statistics. This was about means and standard deviation and look at average time in delays in courts and you know, counting descents. Then we move to regression analysis because we got more data, we got more variance. And now, as you, those of you who are familiar with this now, we are now doing all sorts of machine learning, including textual analysis. We are now entering the stage of natural experiments in law. And to a large extent, we just follow in the trend in economics. I mean, just a few weeks ago, as you know, uh, the Nobel Prize in economics went precisely to people who have been developing methods to be able to identify causality rather than mere correlation. And that's where we are at this stage with empirical legal studies. We're moving into discussions about how to really know this is causality rather than mere correlation. How do we know that judges favor some sort of situations? Like why do judges respond to temperatures in the room? Why do judges respond to being after lunch or before lunch in their decisions? Uh, is this really causation? Or we discovered in some cases in the US, actually it was mere correlation. The problem was that the clerks prioritized before lunch the most relevant cases because they respond to lawyers and the wealthier and more important lawyers push for cases early in the morning. So it had nothing to do with lunch, which was the narrative, how judges respond to lunch. They're much nicer after lunch than before lunch. And now we know this was mere correlation. This was not causation. What happened is a selection effect in cases. Before lunch, you get the most difficult cases because those usually have the most prestigious lawyers who push for these cases in the morning. And usually you get the easiest cases in the afternoon because those are sort of the public uh, defense or the least prestigious lawyers. And so a lot of the discussion five years ago, how lunch makes a big difference, 
five years later is, oh, actually it makes no difference. It has nothing to do with the judge having lunch. It has to do with the way the clerks organize the lodge of cases. So, um, having got there, uh, where are we? Well, we are at the position where I think we can predict a lot of judicial behavior. Let's say 10%. That's a lot. I mean, 10% could look low, but it's a lot because we moved from 0% 20 years ago to 10%. We now know that uh, gender matters, ideology matters, race matters, subject matters, um, politics matters. We, we know a lot of, you know, if you want uh, lunch, uh, temperature in the room. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, nature and nature matters. So, uh, yes, we know all of these things might matter at this point and we are having discussions about how to quibble with this different uh, determinants. But we also know uh, we can't really explain everything. In fact, mostly things we can't explain. Uh, that's why if you want to use the R square with all the caveats of interpreting R squares, our R squares are usually uh, below 20, 25%. So a lot is still the random, uh, the error term. And the error term, as you know, includes many things includes omitted variables that we don't know about, that we don't really have uh, data about, or that we are not still clear that we should include them. Uh, it includes unknown effects, uh, unknown, unknown relationships that we haven't really developed, even at a theory level, for whatever reason. Uh, includes emotions and things that are too largely uh, difficult to predict and to categorize. And of course, there is an error term that has to do with purely randomness. The fact that many times decisions are random to a certain extent. Now, what are we going to do in the future? I think in the future, what we'll be doing is reducing this uh, non predict 90% to less and less. Ideally, in the future, we'd get to a position where we predict 90%, and randomness is down to 10%. And that's where I think this gets into the problems caused by the judiciary, right? So as you develop more social sciences, uh, psychology, sociology, and political science, and of course, as we develop economics into the future, and we make it more systematic and better at explaining certain things, we will improve our ability to predict judicial behavior. And this will be done with more sophisticated econometrics, obviously. And as we develop more sophisticated econometrics, we will have better software. And as we have better econometric software, we'll be able to get better and better at predicting judicial behavior. Now, this might look like a research agenda that we like, and I like because I do it, and other people in the room, I'm sure, like it because that's their research agenda. But it does create a challenge to the judges. And that's where I want to sort of make here uh, my remarks about why the judges will become more and more careful dealing with this. And let me start with some uh, science fiction and try to understand why science fiction, and it's still science fiction, is a problem, right? So these are my applications. I'll skip this application. Actually, the one that was being mentioned is this application where we try to predict the behavior of judges in Catalonia. Uh, what I want to go, yeah, and here is an excellent um, reference to uh, a, a literature review of the current evidence on judicial behavior in India um, by uh, Sunita Parikh. Uh, she just, uh, Parikh, she just uh, uh, edited a chapter on the book I'm, uh, I'm uh, editing on a high course in global perspective. And Sunita has a very good chapter on um, the Supreme Court of India and what we know empirically about the Supreme Court of India at this, um, at this point. But, well, I want, before I, I go to the point I want to make, let me show what's the problem. The problem is once we have machine learning, once we have a lot of predictions, we'll get you automated, automated judge, justice. And I think that's where the judges feel extremely uncomfortable. And they feel extremely uncomfortable, um, not just because nobody likes to be assessed, that's sort of obvious. I mean, any, any professor, and I'm a professor and I've been a professor for many years. I've known Bernd Shaver for many years. And um, we, I mean, as professors, of course, we don't like to be assessed. I mean, I like to think I'm good at what I do. 
I do not like to be uh, compared. I do not like to be told that my citations could be higher than they are, that my papers could be better than they are. Uh, at my stage, as, 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 as the stage as Bern Schaefer is, I don't think another paper of us makes any difference in our CV, but I still get upset when I get my paper rejected in any journal because nobody likes to have papers rejected, even if it's your paper number 120. I mean, the fact is nobody likes to have people telling you your paper sucks. Uh, that's still offensive after all these years, of, of course. So judges have the same attitude. I mean, they don't like to be compared and assessed. They don't like valuations. They don't like to see papers saying you're a bad judge and the other guy is a good judge. Uh, they don't like to see papers saying this judge decides a lot of cases. That judge is lazy and doesn't do a lot of cases. Moreover, of course, there are political black, black, uh, backlashes, right? I mean, I, I, I remember myself, I, at some point with my co-author, Lani Xcreza, we became um, cited in the Philippine Supreme Court, uh, no, in the Philippine, uh, in the impeachment of the Philippine Chief Justice a few years ago, about six or seven years ago, because our papers showed that uh, the Supreme Court uh, Justice, in particular Chief Justice, always favored the president. And they were citing this as evidence of corruption to impeach the paper. I don't like to be involved in an impeachment procedure, but I'm pretty sure uh, the chief justice was not happy that our papers were there, that we actually had data showing that, yes, you always favor the president no matter what in the last seven years. And, and that was sort of political backlash. So there are consequences um, of, uh, of, of these papers when we argue that uh, you know, the constitutional court always favors the incumbent. Or when we argue that, um, you know, 70% of the judges are always aligned with the party. Another paper I wrote on, on the Italian constitutional court, my, my, my co-author was called by the judges because she's Italian and, and she was told, you are destroying the reputation of the court. And when she tried to argue, no, you are destroying the reputation of the court because you are the judges, I'm just a researcher. No, the fact that you write papers showing how the court is completely aligned with the political parties is destroying the reputation of the, 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 of, the, of, of the court. So there is, of course, a lot of pressure and political backlashes from these studies. And so it's not surprising the judges are upset and they may want to try to hide the data or make the data less available. But my point is it's deeper than that. There is that, 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 that dimension of not wanting to be uh, judged and assessed and accountable. But there is a deeper dimension. And the deeper dimension is the sense that if we can predict judges to a 90% or a 95% uh, in the future, then we can replace judges by in, uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So we can actually have computers doing a lot of what the judges do today. This is not far fetched, this is not uh, 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 scientific fiction. We do have this in the United States already where we ask algorithms to calculate the probability of recidivism. When we calculate algorithms to calculate, to calculate the appropriate damages and awards, slowly this is happening. And if we have co computers deciding rates of recidivism and awards and damages, it's not difficult to see that in 50 years, we'll have computers doing a lot of the work that is being done by judges. True. They will also be doing the work of lawyers, and that's why lawyers are worried that some of their work is going to be taken by uh, uh, computers. But judges, I think, are more sort of aware of this problem, that the more the data is available, the better their behavior will be predictable. And once it is fully or near fully predictable, we don't really need judges anymore. We can have machines and computers doing this with some advantages in terms of at least uh, reducing inequality or reducing variance inter-sentencing because computers will not be subject to random effects unless we program computers to be subject to Roman, uh, random effects. So I don't think Judge Dredd is that uh, science fiction. It will happen, uh, although I have to say it's a bad movie with Stallone, but it's sort of where I see this is going. That is, we will come to a point where 
machines will tell uh, us what to do passing judgment. Of course, in the movie, those of you who have seen the movies know that only human, the humans only uh, program the machines, so they are the high council. And so that to some, to that respect, we can imagine humans will be the legislators. Humans can still decide what's a crime, what's not a crime, what's appropriate, with what is not appropriate. But once humans write the coding, once you, humans program the machine, then uh, there's nothing much left to do except having the machines deciding uh, if you're guilty or not, and if you are guilty, what should be your punishment given uh, appropriate uh, concerns with whatever we think is appropriate because we humans have programmed the machines. I do, think, I do think that's still very far ahead, obviously. I don't think it's going to happen next year. I do think it's going to happen at some point, and I think judges are concerned with this, that the more data we have, the better program we can have, and the better program we can have, the less room it will be left for judges to actually do the sort of jobs they do uh, today. So, to conclude, I think future law is going to be heavily based on artificial intelligence. I think that scares the current judiciary about this possibility, the fact that this will change dramatically the nature of the courts and the nature of the judiciary. And they do understand that the road for that future law is to data mining, data collection, data studies, and using the data to program computers. And I think they feel very reluctant uh, in that respect. And I think that is starting to be an issue for our research because the courts and the judges are more and more reluctant to share data with um, with us. And I, I will stop here and, and see if there are uh, questions or, 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 or comments. Amakanu, please take over. Um, sure, ma'am. I was just waiting for certain questions or any discussions. Oh. I request the participants to unmute yourself if you have any questions or comments, or you can use the chat box over there. Okay. So there's one uh, question and a comment uh, in the chat box. Can I read it to you? Yes, yes, I, I'm reading it. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, 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 sure. I, 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 I agree that. Um, that, oh, this is a question to Professor Schaefer. So, in in any case, let me just add while I'll give I'll, I'll pass the word to, to Professor Schaefer um, that the, the same the same logic might apply here that um, um, data um, about uh, about the judges um, can be regulated very much the way that other other um, sectors the questions about the banking sector and I'll leave it that to Schaefer. But I, I, I think uh, this, this does not exclude the fact, and, and, and that's what judges are doing. They try to regulate the data we can, uh, we can, we can get out of the courts and the judiciary. Um, I, I still think that all these regulations uh, just slow down the process. They will not dramatically change the process. But the question is essentially about sharing data. And so, uh, Bern, I think the question is for you. Do you see the question on the chat? Yes, I see. Thank you, um, Nuno. It was great to see you again and to hear your talk. Uh, with regard to the question, <clears throat> um, yeah, well, uh, information intermediators, it, it is an interesting point. I have not thought about this. 
as uh, as far as I can see, um, the discussion is now, uh, and also not only the discussion, but also the um, um, uh, the drafts of new bills is uh, about uh, either a default rule where you have access and then you give the, you know, there are some possibilities of the internet firms to uh, not to um, deliver data. So that is one rule, uh, a property rule, uh, um, an open kind of open access rule with some uh, um, exceptions. Then it is about portability. That is, I have not delved into this very much, uh, but portability means that, for instance, if you have a business uh, with Amazon and you change your business to some other platform, you can take all your data with you. That is possible. Uh, and uh, that will be possible in the EU. Uh, and then uh, the um, possibility um of uh, uh of antitrust law uh, which is of course um rever reversed uh, they, they have a, a property right and but with some exceptions and um intermediators um i have to think about this uh, it has not come to my mind so far but i think it's an interesting idea uh no, no, I think there is a question for you also. Yes, there's a question for me, and then there's a question back to you from yeah. Renita. So let's go over my question, and then I'll, I'll, I'll send the question back to Schaefer. I think we can do this sort of game. Um, so, um, um, yes, I, I, I think to a large extent, um, the data right now um, is being used to um, help procedure. For example, I, I gave the example of sentencing. But obviously, you have the same. Um, uh, some courts are now using computers and artificial intelligence to do uh, distribution of cases uh, and assign cases to uh, judges based on some metrics, uh, which could be yes, efficient judges, but could be you know workload. Uh, you, you 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 know you 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 can construct a complex indicator in order to do this. Uh, depending on multiple variables you, you, you want to use. And potentially, this should improve the functioning of a court. But it does go to the question you raised, because uh, even at that simplest level, the question is, do we want human emotion to play a role in the distribution of cases or not? Now, in the old days, we call that randomness. Um, of course, uh, the fact that or being lucky or, or unlucky, the fact that some, some judges would get some cases that are, you know, uh, much better for their career or to get media attention and other judges didn't. And so a lot of randomness played a role. Once we have an algorithm, unless we want to have it with randomness, because, of course, we can program the algorithm to have randomness, uh, we may get rid of this. And so the first question is going to be, uh, do you want to have randomness in this sense? And, and I think that relates to, do you want to have human emotion? Because to some, some ways, we still have sort of the sense that we cannot program machines to reflect emotion. But I am a believer that the more we'll go forward with technology, at some point, we will be able to program machines to have some sort of choices that could resemble uh, emotions. I don't think machines will be able to love or hate, but I do think you can program machines to have decisions, choices that play as if the machine could love or hate. And at that point, the question is, do we want that? So that raises a very general question, which is, are human emotions, more generally, is randomness a good thing or a bad thing in a court or in a judicial system? And I think that discussion is ongoing. Some people think yes, some people think no. But I don't think that discussion will change the trend in the future. Uh, and I think we'll have more of these things uh, coming forward. And I, I think judges will be reluctant and more and more reluctant 
to have this sort of computers uh, doing this sort of, of, of jobs. Okay, I think the next questions are for you, Bern, they're from Renita. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Renita, uh, thanks for your question. Uh, two questions uh, are there. <clears throat> well, uh, with regard to the first question, I think it is very important to understand that the um, rationale of private property uh, exists, you know, the, this usual rationale which we give to private property as an absolute right which the owner of this right can defend against everybody against the rest of the world. That is what we call erga omnes rights. That exists only, or the rationale for this exists only for things. And, you know, we have inherited this legal institution of property from Roman law. And in Roman law, the uh, uh, property was only defined for things. Also, I have to say for slaves, which were regarded in Roman law as things, not as persons. Uh, and that guaranteed that these things goes to the highest valued user. But for information, such rights did not exist. Uh, property did not exist until the 19th century. It is a very new development and uh, the uh, uh, it, it developed only because there exists, uh, if the information is only, you know, if, if somebody has a privileged information, then the uh, economic um, uh, analysis of this is he should share it with everybody else in the world. There should be, there is no rationale for giving him a privileged access or a privileged dominion over this information, except you have a trade-off between producing new information and, uh, you know, sharing all the information. So the, this is a, when we talk about intellectual property, we are in a totally different world uh, when we talk, uh, then the world when, which exists uh, when we talk about um, the, um, about, um, I think in that sense. Your second. Uh, Ms. Seker, can I uh, have one question, please? Sure, uh, sure. Yeah, sure. I sir. just wanted to. Yeah, uh, this, can is, I just, uh, yeah, this right? is to Dr. Uh, uh, Garupa. Um, can I? Yeah, may I just answer the second part of the question of uh, Ranita? Oh, sorry, Professor Schaefer, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's very sure. sure. Uh, um, you say, uh, well, there is a risk of continuously redefining privacy. Um, that is a very important uh, point. Uh, I have not delved into this, uh, but it is very important that it is um, when we define a property right, then it is a right which a privacy is kind of property right, uh, uh, erga omnes, uh, and such rights must be easily recognizable because every it, they, these rights impose a duty on everybody, on a large number of people whom you don't know, who come from different countries and so on. So therefore, in a globalized and uh, commercialized world, property, what, well, in the sense of, uh, of rights against everybody, must be easily re recognizable. Other than, for instance, contractual obligations, it must be simple and easy uh, and must be also protected easily uh, in, uh, by a simple hands-off rule. And this is not guaranteed for um, privacy because uh, it is very difficult to define when a data, a, you know, a, a privacy protected data is, um, uh, becomes um, anonymized or depersonalized. 
So, for instance, if you buy a Rolex watch, for instance, uh, then uh, if somebody buys a, a terribly expensive uh, watch, then, of course, this is privacy protected. But now you have a bill. On the, on the bill, you have the, the name, the first name, the sex, the address, and many things. So now if you remove the name, then it is still privacy protected because from the rest of the information, you can still guess who this person is. And this is very difficult to, to draw the, the border. And therefore, it is difficult to define uh, uh, to define uh, under what conditions a person is still protected by a privacy right and under what condition this is not the case. And there is a huge uh, di discussion among lawyers who specialize in these, uh, you know, data protection, but it's, uh, it's a big uh, question which is totally unresolved so far. Um, I think uh, I'm ready now with my oh, answer. Oh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Karupa, uh, I have one observation and one question, please. Uh, one is in India, uh, the government of India announced smart cities. And as part of the smart cities, uh, they are installing surveillance cameras across the cities. Uh, in order to really improve the law and order situation. And I'm sure this technology will help us to identify and uh, to have a kind of uh, storage of the data as an evidence where this can be used in the courts uh, for uh, solving the uh, whatever the uh, civil cases and criminal cases. And uh, this will reduce the loss delays uh, where uh, there is a uh, one of the paper presenter in this conference mentioned that on average, uh, it is taking 10 years time. Uh, so that is one point. And the second point is, particularly in the case of criminal cases, when we use the technology, uh, even by using uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, 90, 90 to 95% accurate the predictions, but even the 5% is a kind of also danger involving in in the case of death penalties. So if if there is no death penalties, um, uh, then there may be a kind of uh, possibility. This is uh, the second one, which I would like to really request you to opine on it. Right, so, 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 so I think what you're saying is the first question is, is technology improves um, um, accuracy, which I think it's correct. And that's why, um, any form of technology that uh, improves monitoring and social compliance uh, will inevitably have a positive effect on um, outcomes in the courts and will make courts um, faster. Uh, that I have no question about it. And, and as you know, I mean, we have um, expanding um, examples of um, online litigation, right? It's becoming popular even in places like China, but even the US and Canada, where for small stakes, you're starting to have online litigation, uh, which technically it's not a judge, it's, it's, it's arbitration, but a lot of this arbitration is, is done by uh, uh, artificial intelligence. And you can, you can expect in the future, based on assembling more and more data, uh, to have these sort of mechanisms that make um, cases go faster. I mean, we, can, we, we, we are very close to having the possibility that most consumer litigation, for example, will easily be done by computers online, where you just have to log in, uh, make your complaint, uh, state the facts in a systematized way by an algorithm, uh, enter the evidence you have, the other side, will respond into the evidence they have, and then uh, a machine will basically decide who wins and how much the company has to pay the consumer. I think we'll be very close to this very soon, um, and in the private sector at least, and I think it's going to be you know, uh, easy to expand that into uh, courts of law in, in, in the future. 
I think I think the real the real problem here is how far do you want to go with uh, with that uh, with that with that data? And as you're saying, uh, there might be cases like the death penalty, or for example, when you want to award punitive damages in the case of the United States, that you do not want to use machines, that you still want to use humans. And so I, I, I'm not suggesting that in the future um, we will jump to a machine-based court, um, like very much like we have with other uh, human interactions. Let's talk about cars or, 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 or jet planes. You will have uh, a hybrid arrangement where machines do a lot of work, but humans also do some other work. I mean, even in terms of cars, I don't think anyone is uh, saying that we'll go into uh, autonomous cars uh, you know, in 24 hours. There will be a long period of time where autonomous cars will uh, coexist with human-driven cars. And so that's the same thing I think about courts. We will have a long time where uh, you know machine-based court decisions will coexist with human-based court decisions. I my point is not even trying to say that's good or bad. Um, I, I I have my own ideas, but that's not what the paper or the talk is about. My point is I think that is what is creating serious concerns for judges is the notion that as we move to a more um, machine-based uh, uh, judicial um, decisions, uh, that will create problems to the human judges and their concern about that. Um, and let, let me just, um, to conclude, uh, respond to one of the questions I have here or a comment I have here on the chat. Uh, yes, I don't, I'm not saying that uh, conservative progressive dimension predicts uh, court behavior because uh, conservative progressive dimension is part of the 10%. It's not the 90%. So uh, clearly there's a lot more going on. Uh, but what I, do, what I am saying is that we have progressed enough at this point to have an idea of how decisions are done. And uh, as we get more data on more different variables, uh, maybe the, as I said, the room temperature, uh, the characteristics of the cases, which to a large extent we didn't have good data, we need a lot of textual analysis to understand that, we will get to a point where things are much more predictable than they are now. Because the, cons the conservative, the political dimension, to be honest, at this point, it's controversial. I mean, when you get Obamacare um, decision and people argue, well, it went, you know, the way it was not predictable because it was five Republicans, four Democrats, and we ended up with a decision that's favorable to the, to the Obama administration. Therefore, that's not uh, really uh, data driven. I would say quite the opposite because eight of the nine justices voted the way we would predict just on the conservative uh, progressive dimension. Now, eight out of nine, it's a very good predictor uh, because it means only one justice didn't really vote the way we would predict. Now, that's an example, an extreme example. There are many uh, unanimous decisions in the Supreme Court of the United States, which would not be predictable from the viewpoint of, of, our, of our conservative progressive dimension, because you would predict always a division. So the fact that you have many unanimous decisions, these are decisions that don't get to the news, because if they're unanimous, most people don't care about them. People, you know, the media cares about the 5-4, does not care about 9-0. Uh, because that's sort of trivial, but that is where the problem lies. It's how how can we protect that there are many situations where the progressive conservative I mentioned doesn't really matter, and for other reasons the judges actually make a nine zero um, decision. And then and then you know you have to move into other courts. So if let's pick the German constitutional court. One of the problems of predicting the German constitutional court or the Italian constitutional court is that um, dissents are not very likely. Dissents are not common practice. In the case of Italian, they are in fact prohibited. So without dissents, how do we make predictions about individual behavior? Because we don't really know how these people are deciding. 
since we don't have good data. So if we need other technologies available, and we are starting to have like textual analysis, surveys, interviews, uh, applications of psychology, of social psychology, of cognitive psychology, then, then I think in the future we'll have this much larger uh, possibilities than the current conservative republic, uh, you know, the conservative progressive information we have available at the moment. Oh, well. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I just uh, have a question for Professor Schaefer to have time with Samakan. Uh, mm -hmm. We are running short of time, sir, as we have planned to validate research. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, by the way, it was a wonderful presentation, Professor Garupa and uh, Professor Schaefer. Many congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thanks. and the apologies to you, Mr. Gautam. Uh, we still have two more speakers on the line, and it's already seven. Uh, we are sorry for that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Garupa, for the discussion and the talk on a very unique and interesting empirical perspective on evaluating judiciary and law. Uh, next, we have the address by the guest of honor for today's event, Professor Shanta Kumar. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, 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 you are. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Dr. Shanta Kumar is a, a director of Gujarat National Law University with about 30 years of teaching experience and is holding in charge as the director of Gujarat Maritime University oh, and also featured as oh, president of the. I'm sorry for the. Let me just check it with the participant. Yeah, it's Mr. Gautam. Yeah. Yes, Professor. Yeah, yeah coming back in uh, line with uh, 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 Professor Dr. Shant Kumar. He is also in charge uh, of the director of Gujarat uh, Maritime University and also been appointed as the president of Gujarat International Maritime Arbitration Center. His areas of specializations are environmental law, human rights law, international law, and constitutional law. He has authored around three books on environmental law and two on human rights law with various research uh, publications and uh, guest lectures and delivering keynote addresses in international conferences in both India and abroad. He is recently elected to represent South and West Asia at the IUCN Academy of Environment Law. Currently, he's a chair of Environmental Law Study Group of the International Association of Law Schools and member of the Teaching Capacity Building Committee of IUCN Academy of Environmental Law. He's also serving as the country focal point for India for ADB project on environment and climate change law. He's a member of advisory board for the development of legal education and legal profession. Along with that, he's also a member of a special task force on school and higher education in Chhattisgarh State Planning Commission. He has executed the environmental law capacity building project funded by the World Bank through CIRA, that is in, uh, in LSIU. The Law, Teaching and Legal Research Skills Project of the British Council and Cardiff University, UK. He is he's also the recipient of the prestigious awards like Environmental Law Champions Development Award from Asian Development Bank Philippines and a Best Social Scientist Award from Indian Society of Criminology. At the IP Fest 2020, Professor Shantakumar has been recognized as an IP Director of the Year. We are so happy to have you here amidst us, sir. I request uh, you to kindly address the gathering. Thank you, Makarna. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction. Honorable Vice Chancellor of Tamil Nadu National Law University, Professor uh, Dr. V.S. Elizabeth. My distinguished colleague at uh, GNLU, Professor Dr. Anita Nagar. The guest speakers uh, for the day, Professor uh, Hans Bond Schaffer, Professor Emeritus at the University of Hamburg, and uh, Dr. Nuno Garupa. Professor of Law at uh, George Mason University. Other distinguished uh, colleagues, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Panta Murli Prasad, Professor of Economics at IIT Kanpur, and Professor Manoj Dalvi, Professor of Finance at Long Island University, and our own Dr. K. Thomas Felix uh, uh, from Tamil Nadu National Law University. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening to each one of you, and I deem it a matter of privilege and honor to participate in the seventh edition of the International Conference of Law and Economics. The advantage of being the last speaker in any conferences that you will be 
you will not be left with uh, anything worthy of speaking since all those worthy topics would have been discussed uh, by all the speakers during the course of the conference the only disadvantage is that uh, even if you have something worthy of speaking the august audience by now will be uh, tired of listening all after uh, listening to all great things and will no more be ready to listen uh, to anything new it is indeed a really a precarious situation since i need to do justice to the role that i have accepted uh, let me speak a few points to emphasize the importance of this subject and uh, the importance of this association and the conference uh, i'll not be uh, taking much time i would want to start by uh, quoting uh, justice oliver wendell holmes uh, it it is it it is that quote is sufficient uh, to conclude this session and to talk about the importance of uh, law and economics as a discipline he says that for the rational study of the law the black letter man may be the man of the present but the man of the future is the man of statistics and the master of economics and this is what uh, justice holmes said long time back i also have another uh, quote by uh, professor bruce ackerman of the yale law school who described the economic approach to law as uh, the most important development in legal scholarship of the 20th century economics as we all know it generally provides a behavioral theory to predict how people respond to laws this theory surpasses intuition just as science surpasses common sense the response of people is always relevant to making revising repealing and interpreting the laws lawmakers often ask how will a sanction affect behavior for example if punitive damages are imposed Uh, upon the maker of a defective product what will happen to the safety and the price of the product in the future or will the amount uh, of crime decrease if third time offenders uh, say are automatically imprisoned the lawyers answered such questions in uh, uh, way back in uh, much the same way as they had 2000 years earlier by consulting their own intuition and any available facts economics actually provided a scientific theory to predict the effects of legal sanctions on behavior to economists sanctions look like prices and presumably people respond to these sanctions much as they respond to prices people respond to higher prices by consuming less of the more expensive good presumably people also respond to more severe legal sanctions by doing less of the sanctioned activity economics has some mathematically precise theories for example the price theory and the game theory and empirically sound methods like the statistics and econometrics for analyzing the effects of the implicit prices that laws attach to human behavior the judges and other officials involved in policy making they actually need a method for evaluating laws effects on important social values economics provides such a method uh, for efficiency lot has been discussed about it today in fact uh, it's 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 a matter of a, a few uh, months or years that whatever uh, dr nuno has said is uh, going to be a matter of reality already we have uh, uh, databases and sites which predict uh, the judges behavior especially in india so we have uh, uh, like artificial intelligence based databases like legit quest which can predict like which judge what kind of judgment you will get so that's currently happening uh, so the economists are actually uh, they, they are experts on two policy values uh, one is efficiency and the second is uh, distribution the stakes in most legal disputes have monetary value deciding a legal dispute almost always involves uh, allocating the stakes between the parties the decision about how much of the stakes each party gets creates incentives for future behavior not just for the parties to this dispute but also for everyone who is similarly situated the economic analysis of law unites two great fields 
and facilitates understanding each of them. You probably think of laws as promoting justice. Indeed, many people can think in no other way. Economics conceives of laws as incentives for changing behavior and as instruments for policy objectives. However, economic analysis often takes for granted such legal institutions as property and contract, which dramatically affect the economy. Thus, you will see differences in laws cause capital markets to be organized differently in Japan, Germany, and the United States. Failures in financial laws and the contracting uh, contributed to the uh, banking collapse of 2008 in the United States and the subsequent recession, which was less severe in Japan and Germany. Also, the absence of secure property and reliable contracts paralyzes the economies of some poor nations. Improving the effectiveness of law in poor countries is important to their economic development, and law needs economics to understand its behavioral consequences, and economics needs law to understand the underpinnings of market. Economists and lawyers can also learn techniques from each other. From economists, lawyers can learn quantitative reasoning for making theories and doing empirical research. From lawyers, economists can learn to persuade ordinary people and art that lawyers continually practice and refine. Lawyers can describe facts and give them names with moral resonance, whereas economists are obtuse to language too often. If economists will listen to what the law has to teach them, they will find their models being drawn closer to what people really care about. I wish to uh, conclude by quoting Judge Richard Posner. He says that to me the most interesting aspect of uh, the law and economics movement has been its aspiration to place the study of law on a scientific basis with coherent theory, precise hypothesis, deduced from the theory, and empirical tests of the hypothesis. He continues to say that law is a social institution of enormous antiquity and importance, and I can see no reason why it should not be amenable to scientific study. Economics is the most advanced of the social sciences, and the legal system contains many parallels to and overlaps with the systems that economists have studied successfully. As envisioned by Richard Posner, uh, the discipline is now very well established with so many associations, including the American, Canadian, European, and now the Indian Law and Economics Associations and several journals. Law and Economics articles also appear regularly in the major economics journals and the approaches common in law review articles. We are extremely uh, proud in uh, uh, conveying that uh, the GNLU Journal of Law and Economics has been recently accepted by the UGC and included it in the UGC care list. Uh, so that is uh, uh, the developments that you see which is happening around uh, in this particular domain. Most of the law schools have uh, faculty members trained in economics, and most of them offer law and economics courses. Many economics departments have also started teaching courses in this field, which is not connected with the law school. So several consulting firms have started specializing in providing economic expertise in litigation. Rightly, uh, uh, Dr. Felix, at, uh, uh, at the uh, time of inter pre presenting this report, he cited the example of Chinese bamboo, and I wish uh, that the Indian Association of Law and Economics, like the Chinese bamboo, will grow rapidly and spread its roots deeply to influence policymakers, legislators, lawyers, and judges in understanding the nuances involved in the economic analysis of law. My special appreciations to the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Tamil Nadu National Law University and to all its faculty members for supporting this international conference on law and economics. I wish the Indian Association of Law and Economics all the very best and wish that they contribute significantly for the development of this discipline through activities such as this international conference. More than a discipline, I personally feel that it is a method to strengthen this field. More and more younger colleagues drawn from both from the domain of law and from the domain of economics needs on doing an economic analysis of law. That will be a significant contribution of the Indian Association of Law and Economics to this community and to this nation at large. I wish the conference a grand success. Thanks once again 
for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be a part of this great global event. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Shantakumar, for a very interesting uh, address and your warm words. I now kindly request uh, Professor Dr. V.S. Elizabeth, Vice Chancellor of TNLU and Patron of ICLE 2021, to deliver the concluding remarks for the event. Thank you, Ms. Amakano. Uh, at this time of the evening, we have been here for the last uh, two and a half, two and a half, two hours and 45 minutes. I must say I deeply appreciate the uh, patience and interest of all the participants who have uh, stayed on since the beginning of this uh, valedictory function. Uh, unfortunately, I can't cut short what I have to say since it is my duty at this time to thank everyone who's responsible uh, for the success of this uh, conference and you know to omit any names would be disrespecting their contribution uh, for what has taken place over the last four years I mean four days and over eight months of you know planning and uh, coordinating and making these four days happen uh, the reason I mean for me this international conference on law and economics is more than just the bringing together of two different uh, of the two different disciplines, you know, law and economics. For me, as someone who has taught at one of the law universities, in fact, the uh, law university uh, for 28 years, and now heading this uh, institution as the vice chancellor for the last two years, the importance of a conference like this lies in the stated objective of the National Law School of India University Bangalore when it was founded, namely to bring about interdisciplinary study of law. But since the 28 years that I served there, I saw very little uh, of actual interdisciplinary uh, study and teaching of law. Uh, it is conferences like this which uh, make it possible to actually take this into a very practical realm of teaching and study of law in the law universities. And I'm really glad to see that this interdisciplinarity already exists in the IITs and other institutions. And because of which, you know, this particular discipline of law and economics has grown as far as it has. The stated mission of the Tamil Nadu National Law University is to impart quality legal education nurtured within a robust culture of interdisciplinary research and teaching in an equitable, respectful, and supportive environment, producing legal practitioners and scholars who will be committed to justice, social transformation, and national development. The vision with which, uh, you know, as a university, we have undertaken uh, these interdisciplinary conferences during this year is to achieve global recognition for TNNLU as an institution of eminence and excellence in all spheres of legal education rooted in an interdisciplinary approach to the study of law such that the graduates of TNNLU will be independent, critical thinkers and socially responsible human beings. And this is something which can be applicable to the students and teachers of all law universities, because all the law universities do have all the social sciences taught, not just law. So they have history, political science, sociology, and economics. And But what we see happening in the law universities is a failure to learn from the disciplines that are there. The entire narrow focus upon the study and teaching of law has resulted in ignoring the realities of life in which we live. The uh, institutions that affect the making of law, the implementation of law, the enforcement of law. And as a consequence, we have seen the failure of many of these laws to achieve the stated objectives in those legislations. And therefore, for me, this conference is a continuation of that. We had our first interdisciplinary conference in May this year, the uh, All India Legal History Congress, again, another international conference, which brought together many people from all over the world in order to look at the relationship between the disciplines of law and history and to learn from each other's methodology 
as well as to see how we can possibly employ the tools of analysis that we have independently developed, but which when brought together in order to study law and to teach law could result in actually transforming our society. And therefore, for me, this international conference on law and economics is a continuum, is a part of that continuum. And as someone who has been, you know, marginally involved in the functioning of the Inter Indian Association of Law and Economics through having been invited to some of their functions and programs, it is indeed a matter of uh, great pleasure to see how far this uh, association has grown in seven years. The fact that seven international conferences on law and economics have been conducted in such a short period of time so as to, you know, gain recognition, which is the reason uh, we have such a, a gallery of stars who have uh, participated in this conference over the last four days. Uh, I therefore want to thank all the people who have been responsible for this uh, to happen. Firstly, I want to thank Professor Bimal Patel, who is the current Vice Chancellor of the Rashtriya Raksha University, the former Vice Chancellor of the Gujarat National Law University, and currently the, uh, a member of the International Commission of Law. Thanks to his vision and the way in which he mentored and uh, supported the growth of the IALE and the ICLE, we are where we are today. I also, he of course, uh, honored us by being the chief guest at the inaugural function of this, the seventh ICLE. I also want to thank uh, Professor Ritu Devan, Professor Amit, Professor Chinmay uh, Tambe, and the others. Uh, who were there in the roundtable discussion, including the uh, moderator for that program, for having ensured a very useful and uh, meaningful discussion around the topic of the pandemic from different perspectives. I wish to also thank Professor Schaefer, uh, Dr. Garupa, Professor Shantakumar, uh, for having accepted our invitation to speak here today at this, the valedictory function of the 7th ICLE. Without your contributions, this valedictory function could not have brought a successful end to the four-day uh, discussions and interactions we've been having. I think it was an apt end uh, to the four-day conference. I also want to use this opportunity to thank all the moderators and chairpersons of the different uh, sessions we have had, including the plenary sessions. Dr. Naresh Bodke, Professor V. Shantakumar of the uh, Azim Premji University, uh, Ms. Shubhanghi Roy, Dr. Malabi Kapal, Dr. Venkata Chalam, Dr. Shalina Susan Matthew, Ms. Kundavi, uh, Dr. Isha Badva, Dr. Chitra, Mr. Vivek Pandey, Professor Mamta Biswal, Professor Panta Murli Prasad, Dr. A. Marisport, Professor Shubhashish. Gangopadhyay, Professor Ram Singh, Dr. Anjani Singh Tomar, Dr. Wutkarsh Leo, uh, Professor Manoj uh, Pandey, uh, Dr. C. Rangarajan, and if I've missed anybody from this, yeah, uh, Dr. Stefan Boyd, uh, who have all, and sorry, Professor Thomas Ulan, who all through their presentations, uh, moderating and chairing the various sessions, made it possible for us to complete all the presentations in a meaningful and order and an orderly fashion. I also want to, of course, at this juncture, thank my colleagues at the Tamil Nadu National Law University, who, as well as the colleagues from the Gujarat National Law University, who acted as chairpersons of the uh, various sessions that we had, uh, both the plenary sessions as well as the technical sessions that we have been having over the last four days. My heartfelt gratitude is also extended to the members of the Indian Association of Law and Economics, particularly all of them who have served as the advisory board members of this, the seventh CLE, ICLE. Uh, I also want to uh, thank all the paper presenters without that kind of quality research and the trouble you have taken to ensure that we have had top class presentations 
over the last four days, this conference would have been absolutely nothing. So thank you very much for having taken the time and trouble to register for this conference and to present full papers, even though, you know, uh, most conferences ask for an abstract and then, you know, give your time to complete your papers. But 83 people actually submitted full papers, you know, within the deadline. And for that, I'm grateful, especially to these people who have made the presentations over the last four days, uh, intriguing us as well as uh, drawing our attention to the directions in which this research in law and economics can be carried forward. Um, I can't possibly uh, conclude this, uh, you know, uh, session without thanking each and every member of the organizing committee of the 7th ICLE, and especially uh, Dr. Thomas Felix, who took care of every single detail to ensure that this conference would be organized in the best manner possible, meticulous in all the arrangements that he made, and totally committed to the success of this conference, reaching out to everyone and ensuring that every single thing that needed to be done to make this conference uh, a success has been done. A uh, big thank you to you, Dr. Thomas Felix, and congratulations on the conclusion of such a successful conference. I also want to thank, uh, at this time, all the student volunteers of TNNLU, as well as the faculty who coordinated the, each of the technical sessions, the plenary sessions, the inaugural and the valedictory, including Mr. Nadish Kumar and Ms. Amakanu, who have anchored the inaugural and the valedictory programs to see that they were smoothly conducted and uh, ensuring that uh, there was no room for complaint from any of the participants. I also want to thank, of course, our IT support team who have been uh, tirelessly ensuring that all the connections, the links, and every single session has gone off so smoothly. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope I have not left out anyone who has contributed to the success of this uh, conference. Uh, I must, of course, say thank you to the IALE for reposing confidence in me and accepting my invitation to host, co-host this seventh ICLE. I also want to use this opportunity to thank uh, Professor uh, Krishna Deva Rao for having accepted my invitation on behalf of the IALE to co-host the eighth ICLE at the National Law University, Delhi. Uh, thank you, sir, for having uh, been kind enough to uh, accept this invitation from me on uh, behalf of the IALE and uh, taking the responsibility to co-host the eighth ICLE. Thank you all very much. Uh, I know that you've had a good four days, given the quality of the papers and the variety of topics on which we have had discussions, and the valedictory where we have touched upon very important issues affecting each one of our lives, directly or indirectly. And for that, once again, a big thank you to everyone. Have a good evening and a great week ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, for the address and the consistent support that you provided for uh, organizing this conferences. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we have come to the end of the session, and I'm sure this conference has benefited all of us. Uh, congratulations and best wishes once again to the entire organizing committee of ICLE 2021, the advisory board members, student volunteers, especially our IT support team. Thank you very much, all of you. I'm sure all of you have given your best for the successful completion of this event. I now request all of you to please raise for the national anthem.
Thank you all of you and see you in the eighth edition of the International Conference on Law, Law and Economics. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, Professor Madam. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Good night. Papa, I want to go to the